A recent survey has uncovered that 52% of Nigerian professionals are considering migration. Today on the program, we shall be taking a look at the Jakba syndrome, its effects and possible ways of reversing it on The Breakfast. The Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited has issued a fresh directive to oil marketers on how to go about getting their refund and the new prices of petroleum products. The NNPCL Retail gave this new directive in a circular released on Sunday and also informed oil marketers how much they will be paying now to get petroleum products. Whether this is going to ameliorate the sufferings of the people and make commuting in Nigeria easier is a question we'll be asking on the program this morning. We'll be taking a look at the front pages of some national dailies and we'll be joined by an analyst on Off the Press to discuss them. Good morning and welcome to the midweek frenzy edition of the Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. I am Maureen. And my name is Nyamgul Agadji. I'm so pleased to have you join us on a weekday like this. And uh, we're hoping that you have inaugurated all the things that you didn't inaugurate in your, <laughs> in your life because this is a time of inauguration. And um, uh, two, two wins for Aquaibom State yesterday. Uh, one of them was uh, the inauguration of the Senate President, who is a one-time governor of Akwaibom State. And the other one is the official recognition of uh, Hilda Bassi, who, was, uh, who has just broken the record for uh, the Kukaton mm -hmm. uh, that she, she did. Uh, it has now become official. It's official now. Yes, the Guinness uh, Book of Records have officially recognized her mm -hmm. report, having investigated all the information that was put out mm -hmm. uh, when that Kukaton yeah. took place. It was supposed to be 100 hours, but um, they subtracted 7 hours plus from her. And the excuse was that uh, she made a mistake when she began and took a few minutes uh, of her five yeah, minutes yeah, break. So, so the break extended for, for a few more minutes, and because of that, seven hours was extracted. How, how, many, <laughs> how many minutes will be extracted? How many hours will be extracted for one minute that was taken extra? I just don't understand what that is. But um, they have their laws, and uh, if she failed any of those laws, and she still won the um, the competition, is it a competition? No, she still broke the record. She broke the record. Yeah. She beats the previous record of 87 hours, 45 minutes set by Lata Tandon, mm -hmm. an Indian in 2019. And yeah, so Nigeria is now on that. Yeah. Okay. Well, unfortunately, whether fortunately or unfortunately, uh, there is another person who started even before the recognition in Ekiti State. I don't know how far that is, whether she's continuing or she's not continuing. She's continuing. The, the first lady of that state has even donated 100,000 Naira gift to her. I am of the opinion that she should have waited for Hilda to get her flowers. A lot of people uh, felt that way, but others said, okay, the sky is big enough for people to fly. But I don't think... I'm Where also, was she before I'm Hilda? Also, I'm also of the opinion that she should have waited. But I also then, understand there's another person who wants to paint. Yeah. There's, even, the there's, there's even another person trying to cook, too. And then there is a prayer thon that is also... I've heard of that one. Highest, you know, maybe how many hours for I've heard of that. I understand he's rehearsing his prayers. Mm -hmm. And the question I ask is, who is this prayer going to? Is it... To God or, or to Guinness or World Shango, Records. Or <laughs> to the Guinness World of Book or, <laughs> or, or to Nigerians, because I don't understand that prayer. Because prayer is supposed to be mostly spontaneous. You know, you're talking to your father because of a need that you have. But planning to say, okay, I'm going to bombard God with, <laughs> with uh, <laughs> the five longest thousand, prayers five ever. <laughs> hours of prayer. And I, I just don't understand. So you'll be praying. Well, well, that's left for. For whoever is going to pray uh, for whatever minutes and whoever he's going to pray to, whether it is the God that we know or is the... Well, even Shongo is known by other people. So whether it's the, the God that they serve in the church or the God they serve in a shrine, whether it's Amadi or her, whether <laughs> <laughs> whatever kind of God that he's going to pray to. But, well, at least 
one good thing from this is that a lot of Nigerians may have may not have known that Guinness World Record is something you can put your name in because you can do something extraordinary. So Hilda has opened the gates for everybody to realize that even a Nigerian can win that. She may not be the only no, Nigerian. No, I mean, um, Kafi. Yes. Kafi. She may not be put the only Nigerian. Put her name in that book yeah, some years but, ago. Dancing. But the frenzy of Hilda is... Yeah, the frenzy. Is, uh, Hilda did... Um, well, back then, we didn't, I'm not sure that Nigerians were that active on social media as we are now when Kafi did mm. her dance thing. Uh, today, Hilda has the advantage of social media, and she did her homework very well. She, she crushed out... the, the website oh, of yes. Guinness World Record, and that was, that was something that gladdened me, because if Nigerians support you, they give their best. That is they it. They give their all, and Hilda got that, and we're glad that at least officially she has been recognized. That's a good thing for me. Yeah, but one of the questions I asked is, is there any monetary gain from Guinness? I hear there to isn't. Anyone? There's I no there monetary isn't. reward well, directly see, from yes, Guinness, but yes. of course this gives you the platform for endorsements, contracts, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. all of that. And so it is something worth trying and what it's, doing. It's like singing at the Super Bowl. They have the Super Bowl in America, and I hear they don't pay them, but it exposes you to so much goodies mm -hmm. uh, after that. So people scramble to be on that. If it's a okay. platform, yes. it's a major platform. Very major platform. So this Guinness World Records, uh, I hear people are always already trying to exploit this. Even before she got the recognition, uh, there was this talk on social media that she was talking about a meet and greet where you have to pay <laughs> lots and lots of money before you can uh, meet and greet Hilda. And, uh, it wasn't lots and lots of money. I yeah. understand it was just three million naira, and some controversies around Are you it. Me now, just three million naira. Three million is just. As, as it stands today, now that she's been recognized, I tell you, no organization is going to be able to have Hilda for less than twenty million. Yeah, but you know this the, this report. The first one came that okay for you to be able to see her mm -hmm. and greet her, you pay that amount of money. But even though she's saying no, that she not, didn't No, it know. wasn't a one-on-one -on -one thing. It no, was it no, was no, no. This, this organization that organized yes. it. And they supposedly, she, allegedly, yeah. allegedly mm -hmm. paid her that sum. All right? They organized it and allegedly paid her that sum. Mm -hmm. And, of course, it's, it's a business. Yeah, but she, she claimed that she didn't know it was centered around her. She thought mm. she was attending an event that she had been invited to and paid to make an appearance. Mm -hmm. She didn't know that it was a meet and greet of her, so she pulled out of the event. Whatever the real story is, but you know, if you do something that is um, noteworthy, you will be in the limelight for the right reasons, mm -hmm. and then you get other goodies that will come to you. Definitely. So everybody should think about doing something Noteworthy. Uh, yes, noteworthy. And especially representing our country, Nigeria. Whatever All right, since we've talked about one of our top trending, let's talk about this, the, the other top trending, which is that uh, the National Assembly has, uh, the 10th National Assembly has now been inaugurated. Mm. We watched and listened to it yesterday, the whole process. Very keen pro uh, contest it was between Akbabio and the person that contested against him. We're talking about as tight as 63 votes to defeat Yari, Abdulaziz Yari that, you know, contested that uh, Senate presidency with Godswill Akbabio. Uh, with all the politicking we saw, with all the games we saw, with all the um, allegations of money uh, and the anointing that he got, mm -hmm. we had thought that it was going to be a lot easier for him, mm -hmm. but it was a very tight contest. He got 63 votes while Abdulaziz Yari got 46 votes. Mm. Okay, well, uh, the coming days will show whether this contest uh, is something that will show us that our democracy is stronger now or that democracy is being bought with mm -hmm. money. Because uh, if he goes there and we find out that really uh, he who pays the piper dictates the tune, then we will know that there's nothing to applaud about this, this election, no matter how keenly contested it might have been. Because if truly, like some papers are carrying it, um, Tinubu's candidates floor um, rebels. You know? <laughs> so it now becomes that he put, practically, he put the leadership of the 
National Assembly where they are. And if he put them there, there's a tendency they will do his bidding, only his bidding. Oh, well. Um, we, pray, we pray it doesn't happen that way. What we pray is a National Assembly that can pass landmark bills and effectively checkmate the executive. Mm -hmm. And if we do not have that, then the National Assembly it cannot be said to be serving Nigerians. We saw what happened with the Ninth Assembly. We're not happy about it. We missed the Eighth Assembly because of how strong and firm Saraki was mm -hmm. in terms of um, scrutinizing requests from the executive. He wasn't a rubber stamp, mm -hmm. you know, Senate president. And that was one thing that stood him out. And that's why today we keep talking about the Eighth Assembly, comparing the Eighth Assembly and the Ninth Assembly. And a situation where you have the executive being so um, involved in who becomes or emerges as the Senate president, mm -hmm. it, it does leave a lot, um, you know, to be desired. But that's what we have playing out. Yeah. His deputy is um, Jibri Barrao, and then Tajuddin Abbas scored 353 to defeat his rivals, Ahmed Wase and Aminu Jaji. And then his deputy is uh, Benjamin Kahlo. Mm. Wase got three votes. Aminu Jaji got three votes. So you can see that one was, he just had, it was like Wakapasi. Yeah, yeah. He had no problem. All the uh, opposition party's uh, members, they voted for him. They, they, they voted for uh, this... Um, Abbas. Abbas of the APC and gave him a whopping 353 votes. Now you have 360 seats in the House with 359 members. Let me break it down for you. Mm -hmm. PDP has 117 members. LP, Labour Party, has 35 members. NNPP has 19 members. ABGA has five members. SDP, two members. ADC, two members. YPP, one member. There is a vacancy because one of the members of the APC after election, you know, lost his life. And so there you have yeah, it. There shouldn't be, there be, um, shouldn't there be a, a vacancy again, another vacancy for Badabia Mila, who is uh, the uh, chief of staff to the president. Will he hold both positions? Obviously not. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, well, th that is it. The breakdown is good. Um, I'm glad we have members of the National Assembly. Akpabio. Uh, is a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Babio has been a governor of a state, and I must say he did well. Whatever else entered his pocket, I don't know. I, don't, I really Nigerians really don't care what goes where, so long as you get the job done. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he had landmark achievements in Akwaibom State, so I give him that. And then he was the minister of Niger Delta Affairs. That much we do not uh, know how to assess because even when he was campaigning, he was, even when he was trying to win people to his side, he said mm -hmm. they shouldn't consider whatever happened in Niger Delta. They should judge him when he was uh, the, the governor of the but state. But that is not for him. You know, he cannot write his history. Yeah. It happened. However, you know, when talking about that thing that happened during his time as that minister, you, 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 when that off-the-mic thing was mm -hmm. said, off the mic was said by those who were going to be exposed, if you remember correctly. <laughs> <laughs> by those who were going to be exposed. So, yes, for him to say, do not judge me by my performance there, means he also knows that. Um, it was abysmal. Because everybody should be judged according to the last thing they did. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is what tells you how your the pres how how you are at this moment and yeah. this is the moment that you want to be a, a senate president and you're telling us not to judge that but well whatever the case is he has become the senate president yeah and nigerians will give him support so long as they don't see him as a rubber stamp and we hope he's not going to be that at all well tajuddin abbas uh, you know said that he is not going to be a rubber stamp that the house of reps will not be a rubber stamp and well don't they all say the same thing Talk who would have come out and say i am going to just be here for the pre president and mm -hmm. not for nigerians mm -hmm. i would approve everything without uh, allowing us to s debate it uh, who is tajuddin abash you may ask uh, we have a little info on him uh, born 1st october 1963 
is a Nigerian academic and politician who is the current Speaker of the House of Representatives. He was born, uh, as I said, in October in Kwarbai, Zaria, Kaduna State, and he holds bachelor's degree in business administration and master's degree both from Amadou Bello University, Zaria. And then he later obtained his doctorate degree in, in business administration from Usman Mfudio University, Sokoto. Uh, he, he began his career as a primary school teacher. He later Same became... with Fabio. Yeah. <laughs> Not primary school necessarily, but as a teacher. There's hope for you. So the... <laughs> There's hope for you, Nyamko. <laughs> but he later became a lecturer at a polytechnic. He was a lecturer at Kaduna State University from 1993 to 2001. He moved to the private sector where he worked as a marketing manager at the Nigerian Tobacco Distribution Company, now the British American Tobacco Company. In 2010, he joined politics where he contested for the House of Representatives seat in 2011 and was elected. Abbas is a prince from Zozo Emirates, Daria, Kaduna State, and holds the title of Ian Zozo. All right, so let's look at his political career. He joined politics in 2010 where he contested. Uh, for the House of Representatives seat in 2011 and won. He sponsored the highest number of bills in the 8th Assembly. He sponsored the eight, the highest number of bills in the 8th Assembly between 2015 and 2019. That tells me this guy uh, knows what he's doing, right? And also sponsored a record-breaking 74 bills, out of which 21 were signed into law between 2019 to 2023. He had served in numerous committees uh, in the House, such as Commerce, Finance, Special Duties, Defense, Public Procurement, and National Planning and Economic Development Committee. Until his emergence as the Speaker, Abbas was the House Committee Chairman for Land Transport. Okay, uh, Goswila Akwabio is now the, um, the Senate President. He is Chief Goswila Akwabio. He's, he's from a royal house in Akwaibom State, and he started out his career um, as a teacher and had a brief stint with Paul Osoro and Co., a law firm in Nigeria, because he is originally a lawyer. Uh, he was also a school teacher for a brief period and worked with uh, a telecoms company, a uh, Lagos-based telecoms company, and served a national publicity secretary uh, of the Association of Telecommunications Companies in Nigeria mm. while a director in uh, that firm. He later became the CEO of that company in 2002. He was appointed Commissioner for Petroleum and Natural Resources in 2002 under the administration of Obong Victor Atta in Akwaibom State. Uh, before 2006, he had served in other capacities such as um, Commissioner for Lands and Housing as well as Commissioner for Local Government and Chief Tenancy Affairs. Um, he became People's Democratic Party's flag bearer in 2007 gubernatorial election. Having defeated 57 other aspirants at the primary election, he became the governor of Akwaibom State in 2007 and spent additional four years after the end of his first tenure. In 2015, Akwaibom was made the Senate Minority Leader by the People's Democratic Party's South-South Group within the National Assembly. Uh, the success of the APC in 2015 election took away the power of majority from the PDP caucus in the Senate, and Akwabio resigned in 2018 as the Senate, uh, uh, as a, okay, he resigned in 2018. Okay, as the Senate issued uh, to one chief, uh, Orizu Adotolo Newi in a number of states and not to the Akwabom state government. Okay, in May 2020, Akwabi was summoned by members of the House of Representatives over the misappropriation of 40 billion naira. He has won numerous awards, uh, international honors and uh, national honors, and he's a household name as far as Akwaibom uh, and South South are concerned. He's now the Senate President of Nigeria, and we're hoping that his background as a lawyer and a one-time governor and also Minister of the Niger Delta Affairs will come to uh, will come to his aid, as it were, to yes. carry out his duties. Yes, and you know, president. looking at the bio of these people, especially Tajuddin Abbas, who has sponsored the highest number of bills in the Eighth Assembly uh, between 2015 and the record-breaking 74 bills, out of which 21 were signed, you probably understand why all the opposition members, mm -hmm. you know, 
backed him in this contest. Um, because sometimes it's not just about the money. Sometimes it's credibility, it's yeah. character. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, he's a member of the APC, but that doesn't make him a bad person, right? That doesn't make him uh, unqualified mm -hmm. for the post. Although we would have wished, I would have wished that since the Senate president is an APC member, <laughs> that the Speaker of the House of Reps would be from the opposition. Well, Maybe it's, the it's, PDP al it's always for the, right. for the people with the highest number. So the opposition will align with the person that they feel comfortable with. So mm -hmm. if he, they voted him, uh, give, uh, more or less, he's also a PDP, a Labour Party, an NMPC person, <laughs> because uh, he is for everybody. He is for and everybody for and nobody. for nobody. Yeah, <laughs> so that's yeah, how it he's, is. He's, uh, his body language will tell us exactly what, where he belongs eventually. Yes, and then we also know that uh, at, at this moment, uh, Governor Rotrumi Akredolu has formally written to notify the Ondo State uh, House of Assembly that he is on medical leave and that his deputy, Loki, uh, should act as the acting governor. Okay, the Speaker of the House, Olamide Oladiji, announced that the governor has embarked on a 21-day leave for medical treatment abroad, starting from 7th of June 2023 to the 6th of July 2023. And, uh, well, it's a laudable thing, but for some time now, there's been this back and forth, he's well, he's not well, he's dead, he's not dead, and all that. And it, it kept being a secret, and I wonder why our leaders feel that when they are unwell, uh, people should not know. They are not supermen. They, are not, they don't have superpowers. It's normal for someone to be ill. You just say, I'm ill, and you hand over legitimately to the next person who constitutionally should take the reins of power when you are awake. You go, take care of yourself, and come back. I don't know why they hide it, but at least Akeridulu, at the end of the day, has said, okay, I'm embarking on this leave. And it's a good thing for our democracy. Yes, We're it's, learning. It's indeed and good it's that he good. has come out officially to put an end to all the speculations. Um, he's human. It's human too. Yeah. He's it human. Is. And, and who, who says he cannot recover? So it's good that he's going to take care of his health, which is primary, yeah. really. It's more important than him being a governor. He needs to be healthy. He needs to be alive. So wish him the very best. We yeah. hope he recovers you know, as quickly as possible so yes. he can return to his office. And then we, we hope that uh, what the president said about um, uh, the rule of law and all that, we hope we'll begin to see. As at this moment, court has ordered arrest of IGP Usman Baba because he has, uh, been, uh, he has been invited a lot of times and he doesn't go for the invitations and all that. So the court has said that the Industrial National, National Industrial Court has ordered the arrest of Inspector General of Police Usman Al-Kali and uh, the Fourth Secretary AIG Hafiz Inua for disobeying court order uh, to reinstate some police officers who were graduates of course 33, 34, and 35 of the police academy. Uh, they have asked him severally, what's the matter? Come and explain to us, and he, he didn't come. And he has failed to reinstate these people, and for whatever Even reason... Even when court has spoken. Court has spoken since uh, uh, July or June last year, and he has still not done anything about it. So let's see whether now he's going to obey the court order and reinstate them, and back with their salaries and arrears and this all that. This fragrant disregard for court orders, mm -hmm. which we saw in the, with the last administration, has got to stop. It has to if stop. If we say we have a democracy, we must respect our judiciary. We it must respect the courts. Mm -hmm. And as much as uh, we say that the judiciary needs to redeem its image, and that is it. When you, yes. Yeah, there's a need to have a good image that should be respected. Mm -hmm. Because you begin to ask, how did all this disregard for the judiciary start? How did it start? How did we get to this point where court will make a pronouncement, give an order, and it's not respected? Mm -hmm. So now you blame it on the, on the executive because they have uh, the power to execute mm -hmm. whatever the court says. So now the court will do the needful, and then the executive will just throw away whatever the court has decided. Well, so it, it doesn't speak well for our democracy it and the institutions we intend to strengthen. Because if the court will be a... A, a toothless dog, as, it, as they say, then it will mean that anybody can do anything. And once the court says something, it will not be carried out. We already know that. So go to court. Mm -hmm. That's what you will be told. Whatever the court says, we will not do. So the institutions we want to strengthen will lie strictly on the executive that has the power to execute and to prosecute, uh, to execute, yes, whatever the courts have said. Mm.
All right, so you're still watching the breakfast. It's time for us to uh, take a break and give you the weather report so you know how to get set for the day. We'll be back to take a look at the headlines. <laughs> 